Anything else? We are starting on time. We so, are we are going yeah. to talk quietly though Ooh, because yeah. it is the morning the after the night before. The, you're the one who asked for the microphones. To be yes. On, so. um, We're all good. The so good morning. Uh, welcome Hi. to the panel on um, on voting. Voting. Uh, um, I'm Matt Blaze. I'm technically moderating uh, this uh, panel. Uh, Only technically, though. And uh, I'm going to just let our panelists introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Randall Schwartz. I've written a bunch of books on Pearl and also done a bunch of other stuff. So, yeah. Floss Weekly and things like that. Yes. And good morning. I'm Kurt Opsall. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, Nonprofit organization dedicated to defending your rights online. We've been uh, caring a lot about uh, election security over over the years, both in our Coders Rights Project, where we've worked with security researchers who are facing uh, legal questions uh, about conducting and disclosing security research, and also uh, trying to uh, use the triennial rulemaking process of the Digital Money and Copyright Act to get exemptions to allow for good faith security researchers on voting machines. And I've been sort of supporting better uh, voting security for everybody. And he'll be doing the rest of the presentation. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I figured I would start out by um, giving a kind of little introduction to uh, the topic, and then we'll let uh, everybody else uh, rant on the panel, rant for uh, their designated amount of time, and then we will turn it over to questions that I'm going to ask in advance. Please phrase your question in the form of a question. Um, so it should have a question in it. Right. Um, so uh, voting is a hot topic. It's been a hot topic for a while. It's been a topic that I've been working um, in as a computer scientist uh, for probably about two decades uh, now. Uh, in particular, uh, in 2000, um, in the year 2000, there was an election in the United States for president, um, you may remember. Uh, the election was extremely close and came down to um, uh, really one or two Florida counties and would end up effectively deciding the outcome of the uh, um, Bush versus Gore race. Yeah. Uh, that race was um, very tight in those counties and in fact was kind of below the margin of error of the voting technology that was used in those counties at the time, which was based on electromechanical punch cards. Uh, essentially you would put, uh, the voter would be given a little um, scored card, they would put it in a voting machine, which was really just this mechanical uh, device uh, that would stick the card underneath a piece of plastic with holes in it. The ballot would basically say to vote for this candidate, punch through this hole with a little stylus to vote for that candidate, um, you know, uh, punch through this other hole and so on. And then you'd take the card out and drop it in the ballot box. So completely mechanical, the only electricity in the voting machine was for the light bulb for the voting booth. Um, now. Uh, then those cards would be taken and put through a mechanical, electromechanical reader, which would use uh, an optical light um, uh, beam through each hole position and uh, record the ballot tally uh, that way. Now the problem was this machine had a buffer overflow in it. Not the, not the counting machine, but the voting machine itself. In spite of the fact that there was wow. no actual um, electricity or computers involved in casting the ballot with the machine, what would happen was there would be little pieces of cardboard that you would push through the card um, and uh, for your preferred candidate. Now this particular election had an unusually high turnout in these Florida counties, higher really than ever before since these machines, which uh, date from the 1960s, had, um, had been uh, used in. And so, you know, in places where normally 100 people would show up, 400 people would show up. Wow. Now, because of conservation of matter, um, those little pieces of cardboard that you punch through have to go somewhere. Well, where do they go? They go right behind where you um, uh, uh, punch them out. And so the effect was that as the day went on, the more popular a candidate was, the harder they got to vote for. 
and it would require physical strength to push the uh, uh, cards through. And what you'd end up with was some candidates would end up kind of just scoring the card, others would uh, um, would uh, uh, only make like a little flap, and so on. And so there had to be a hand recount because sometimes the uh, machine reader wouldn't recognize an attempted vote. This was very embarrassing. There was a famous picture of you know, somebody with a magnifying glass up to one of these. And there was, in spite of the fact that the country was utterly divided on who should be president, the country was unified that this was an embarrassing technology. And everybody got to make fun of Florida. And uh, Congress passed uh, in 2003 an amazingly bipartisan piece of legislation, uh, one of the most bipartisan pieces of legislation. You know, it might as well have been called the Puppies and Kittens Are Adorable Act of 2003, <laughs> called the Help America Vote Act, um, which essentially mandated federal funding to replace this obsolete voting technology, obsolete voting technology, with new technology that had to meet um, new modern standards. And in particular, the standards required that, the, that new voting technology that you could pay for with this funding be accessible. Um, so that, um, for example, it would have to have um, audio interfaces and um, things like sip and puff mobility impairment interfaces and so on uh, to help um, everybody be able to vote easily and not require that you have the physical strength to um, punch through a, a, a hole on the card. Sounds great. The problem was that the, techno the technology that existed in 2003 didn't meet this standard. So industry had to step up and invent new technology, get it out onto the market to spend this huge pile of money. And um, you can imagine that as much care and attention to having this be secure and reliable as you would expect, given a big pile of money and a race to produce technology to spend it, um, uh, you know, would be taken. And uh, many, many questions were raised about the security and reliability of this voting technology. In particular, the most prominent of these voting technologies was what we call, we in the voting business, call DRE machines, which stands for, great acronym, Direct Recording Electronic Voting Machines. Direct recording means the vote is recorded in the voting machine itself in internal memory. Electronic meaning it uses electricity to do it. In essentially a voting computer. In practice, what these are are touchscreen computer machines that get programmed before the election uh, to display a ballot, um, record the um, ballot tally for each candidate um, as people vote, and at the end of the day, a memory, the memory card from the machines is removed and put into another computer to um, tally up the result. Many questions have been raised about whether or not the computers that are used for voting are in fact reliable and secure enough. And in fact, DRE machines have a particular problem, which is that they depend utterly on the security and reliability of the hardware and the software um, for the security and reliability of the entire election. And if, for example, it turns out that there was a software error, um, you may never be able to recover, no matter how much recounting you do, you may never be able to recover the true vote. So these machines are unusually dependent on software security. Now, I have a panel here of people with expertise on software, um, everybody on this stage, and I think everybody, I can speak for the people on my left and on my right, which would say that, uh, who would all tell you, software really sucks. Right? We don't know how to build complex, reliable software. And so the question of what do we do about this is, um, uh, it has been a big question in the 15 years since the Help America Vote Act has passed. Beyond that, there are other computers used in voting. It's not just voting machines, but actually the entire election system that depends on computing technology from top to bottom. 
voter registration, those are databases maintained by computers, those are generally connected directly or indirectly to the internet. The machines that provision voting machines, that define the ballots and that program the actual voting computers are general purpose computers generally running you know, Windows XP um, uh, and uh, are c connected directly or indirectly to the internet. The machines that tally the vote, um, uh, that, that total up the results and report the outcomes, again, same, same thing. And then the machines that report the results to the people on the web, obviously, are computers themselves. So we, are, we have basically gone in uh, a situation where in about 15 years, we have gone from something that you could hand count um, if you aren't sure whether or not the counting mechanism works to something that is just completely dependent on the correctness of software. And that is the situation we, that we find ourselves in in uh, 2018. Fortunately, some progress is being made and we'll discuss that as we go on. So let me um, turn it over first to Randall. So we're, we're seeing voting machines though that have like a USB port and so you can plug in some sort of device to that. Mm -hmm. And we're also seeing voting machines that have Wi-Fi enabled. Why? Why does a machine need to be Wi-Fi enabled when it's a voting machine? It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Well, fortunately, there was one model of machine uh, called the WinVote, which was just the, the, you know, it was like that was the machine that was intended to warn us about how terrible it could be. Mm. Um, it it uh, that has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth uh, in it, but they didn't actually advertise that it had that. Uh, in it, and it ran Windows, and you could rickroll it from the voting interface, and so on. Fortunately, that has been decertified everywhere <laughs> in the United States, but there are machines with slightly less laughable vulnerabilities that are still there. But it, but it's like, how can you possibly trust a machine that has that kind of access? It just there's no way to do that. It's it's like this. These are votes. These are like. It should be people saying, I want this or that. Yeah. And how can it possibly be that when the machine can be hacked, the machine can be adjusted, the machine can be, you know, uh, denigrated? All right, well, these are, these are very good questions. Uh, there have been some good ideas on, on what to do about some of these problems. I think one of the most prominent ones is a voter verified paper trail so that Right. Uh, if you're doing direct entry, perhaps it creates a printout that you can look at and then is available for a hand count. Also, some places will use optical scan where you mark the paper and then the, the counting is, uh, the initial counting is done at least by the, the machine, but you can again hand count the, the optical scans. Um, you can also do things like audits uh, to, uh, as, a, as a regular thing, is if you have this voter verified paper trail, also uh, conduct uh, statistical sample audits uh, with a relatively few number of, of hand counted audited things. You could have some idea whether it is you have a, uh, a problem or, or not. Um, the voter verified portion is, is important, especially for uh, machines that, while well, the, the advantage of being accessible, the touch screens, uh, sometimes the calibration will be off. So you know where you push on it is not where it registers being pushed. And if you have an election with lots of different things on the same screen, that can mean that you, you think you're pushing for one and, and ends up with the other. So having a system where it prints out the results and the voter can look at it can be very helpful. Um, we talked about you know things like not having Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, you know, that, that uh, uh, for a lot of these machines, you can air gap them so that they are not directly connected to, uh, to the internet um, and not, uh, be accessible as readily uh, for anyone who at least is not physically present. That at least limits the uh, the kinds of attackers that you might need to worry about if they have to actually go to a particular voting machine and, and mess with it. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that we care uh, a lot about uh, at EFF is making sure that there is room for uh, security research. And this means that uh, not um, unfortunately, there has been some uh, resistance by the election voting companies to uh, security researchers. They are. You think? 
to, I mean, once or twice they mm-hmm. have been. I mean, this this this, uh, this happens a lot with, with with industries, especially if they're new to having security researchers look at their stuff. Because while we realize that everything is broken, and it's a matter of like mitigating it and trying to you know reduce the harm and and deal with uh, you know fail safes in a well. If it's broken, how can it be broken in the the least bad way? Kinds of issues. They're like, no, our stuff is great. Why are you defaming us? Um, and I think, uh, well, I wouldn't want to steal uh, uh, Matt's thunder, but there was some great work done at the last couple of years at DEF CON where security researchers were uh, going into uh, looking at machines and uh, got a lot of press on it. And I think this made a lot of those companies nervous. Uh, and the correct reaction should have been, thank you for doing this. Fix How can we code. help? And uh, uh, try and uh, like let's work together to make these things uh, more secure. But unfortunately, that, that's not the reaction that they've had. Actually, well, it turns out no. Yeah, I, yes. I, yeah. I mean, I, this is my shocked face. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, you want uh, yes. the village. So um, we got an, an exemption to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act for um, uh, good faith security research into consumer products, and the Copyright Office specifically said voting machines are a consumer product because you know consumers vote on them um i wasn't expecting that but they did um so uh the basically anyone doing good faith security research um who is not actually attempting to infringe copyright um can be covered under this exemption um to the digital millennium copyright act and it effectively makes it possible for the first time for people to get voting machines and you know reverse engineer them, figure out how they work, and examine them. Um, so I helped organize for the last uh, couple of years uh, a voting machine hacking village at the DEF CON conference, which is, uh, you know, Las Vegas is the best place to be in August. The weather is beautiful. Um, the, um, uh, you know, uh, we, we basically got a bunch of surplus voting machines um, on eBay and from other uh, sources, uh, put them in a big room, and let people at them. And, uh, you know, people were quickly rediscovered many of the vulnerabilities that um, people like me had dis- uh, had been able to find when we were given official access to these machines as part of uh, reviews. The hacker community just, you know, like 20 minutes after the doors opened, people were, were um, uh, you know, loading new firmware onto machines and finding vulnerabilities and so on. Um, and uh, that, you know, was a remarkable success, not just for finding vulnerabilities, because we know these machines are vulnerable. But I think the most important uh, aspect of this is we managed to basically train another generation of experts in this technology. Um, and, and that's the probably the most lasting and important contribution here. Prior to uh, the voting machine hacking village and the DMCA exemption, there were you know, a few dozen people who've examined voting machines seriously who are independent researchers who aren't working for voting companies or for uh, government agencies, but who, are, who actually have you know, complete independence. That number is now in the thousands um, because you know, we basically opened the door to anybody who wanted to be there. Um, now, we know these, that DRE voting machines are insecure. Um, and they're fundamentally insecure. They're insecure for you know sort of two sets of reasons. One is that the vendors have done an utterly terrible job securing them. There are laughably bad vulnerabilities in them. But there's the more fundamental problem that even if they weren't laughably bad the way they are now, they'd still be bad because you, you fundamentally have the problem that you are depending on software whose properties you can't understand. And in particular, you can't even really reliably know that the software you examined, even if you had confidence that you could examine software, that the software you examined was actually the software that was running on the machines people were voting on. Right? So you're dependent not just on the software, but you're dependent on the utter integrity and reliability of the hardware to not have new software run on it. We just don't know how to do that. So, What does that mean? Does that mean we cancel elections, turn the United States into a hereditary monarchy, and just give up on this voting idea? Um, You know, that looks good, although I'm not quite sure I want the hereditary monarchy starting where it is right now. Um, No, no. But um, 
Uh, what do we do? So virtually every expert who has looked at this problem has settled on a really important idea that Ron Rivest, um, a professor at MIT, uh, came up with uh, about 10 years ago called software independence. What he said was that a voting system is software independent if you can recover the true vote even if all of the software used in that election was tampered with. So an example of a software independent system would be paper ballots, right? You could use machines to print them, you could use machines to count them, but you still have that artifact of the uh, voter's intention that didn't have any software involved in the path to get to it. Um, now, can we achieve software independence? Well, it turns out, yeah, we can. Uh, and in fact, there's technology that's in use today that has great software independent properties optical scan paper ballots um, uh, where the voter marks the ballots or a separate device marks the ballot on the voter's behalf um, uh, and then that's deposited in a sealed box. You can machine count them later if you want, but coupled with something called risk limiting audits, a statistical technique invented at Berkeley, um, you can with high confidence audit a sample of ballots, compare them with the machine result and uh, get a high confidence that the software is giving you the correct result after any given election. And you have to do this in particular statistically valid ways, but you can really increase your confidence that may, uh, approaching, you know, kind of complete software independence. Okay. Um, so this technology exists. Many states currently use it. Many states do not. We are in a state that does not. Um, th but, uh, you know, there's progress being made. Before we open it up to questions, one quick plug. On Thursday, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine uh, is releasing a study done over the period of a year on the future of voting technology, where they will be talking about a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today and making fairly weighty recommendations on where we should go going forward. So if you're interested in this, pay attention to that report when it comes out on Tuesday. And I think also we want to talk both about just the fraud that's possible by having bad voting machines, but the influence of governments, not ours, <laughs> to bias the votes. So we got to talk about both that. Okay. So we uh, there is a thing floating around, and yep. there is a box. box. Very interested in the question. Speak of the box. Oh, hi, I'm, I'm Smike Duval, and I'm actually a candidate for the Secretary of State. I jumped into this race <coughs> because of this issue. And when you were talking about uh, canceling the election, uh, if anybody that's in Georgia, there is a lawsuit going on right now, <coughs> to get heard on the 18th, about whether they're going to force Georgia to decertify this year. Um, and drop the paper of ballots <coughs> emergently. Wow. And it's interestingly, the part that the plaintiffs are going to argue is, is that they're not going to hack the machines themselves. They're going to hack the voter registration system and cause uh, mayhem there for people showing up at the polls. And therefore, by extension, um, have a huge distrust in the machines. Um, and I just wanted to say that, that uh, I've been part of the lobbying effort. Um, we did help get um, Senate Bill 403 defeated because they were still trying to put in uh, types of machines that had unverifiable votes. Uh, follow the money. It was $120 million plus about $500 million in uh, extension contracts. If anybody wants to know about what's specifically going on in Georgia, I can talk to your off about it. Excellent. All right. So, <coughs> for those of you who don't know, Secretary of State is probably the most important state office you've never heard of. Um, <laughs> in almost every state, the head voting official of the state is called the Secretary of State. Um, they also do some other things in, in most states, but they are the sort of state's lead voting official in, in almost every state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So my question is, what about paper ballots? You could just stuff the box if you work there with false ballots so that seems equally bad it seems like you would need both electronic and paper to be most secure yeah and there's a long history of ballot box stuffing and bad things happening to, to ballots uh, that's one of the reasons why the sort of the optical scan paper ballots precinct counted optical scan paper ballots are 
are, are kind of this happy medium um, because essentially what you do is the voter marks a ballot. That ballot gets fed into a reader that looks sort of like a fax machine that reads the ballot, performs a tally, and then drops the ballot into a sealed ballot box. Now you have to love the system to make it work. You have to pay attention to it. You have to watch it. You have to make sure people aren't uh, tampering with the recorded paper ballots. But it has the benefit that that ballot gets tallied immediately after the voter casts it. So um, you know, if the um, paper ballots are ultimately tampered with, you have this electronic record that was contemporaneous with the vote itself. It's not perfect because, you know, if somebody makes off with the paper, the box of paper ballots, you, you know, you're, you're not left with it. But that, that's kind of a, a fundamental uh, property that we still have. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty ignorant about voting machine technology, so this may be a ba too basic a question. But in Georgia, we vote by putting uh, basically what's like a credit card into the machine, vote, and it records it, and then we give them the card. Is that not uh, an artifact of some kind, the, the plastic? No, the, the, the little paper, uh, the little uh, plastic card basically enables the machine for to record one vote. So what the poll worker does is puts the machine into a little card writer, and that card writer um, sets the card up to say, okay, voting machine, when this is inserted into a voting machine, it will turn that voting machine on and allow one person to vote with it. And um, uh, the actual vote is being recorded inside the voting machine, not on the card itself. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, one thing that I've uh, often thought about with problems like this, when I, I, I work in InfoSec and health care, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, similar issues come up no matter what you're talking about, but as far as anything involving the public and public organizations like healthcare or voting, my, my uh, question for you, for you guys is, how do we raise these issues with either elected officials or the public, just people's influence in general, when, you know, I, I'm coming at them from another planet, when I'm, you know, even something as basic as, here's what a mitigation is, here's what your risk is, it's a whole other lingo to them. So how, how do you bridge that gap? I think there's a lot of uh, activism that one can do to try and bring these things to, to the attention of your, your local uh, officials. Uh, many secretaries of, of state are uh, uh, elected offices, and so people can ask questions about that, that sort of thing. Um, and in some cases, there has been legislation to try to uh, create uh, uh, standards. Um, I think there, um, one of the key things really to solve this on a national basis is not only creating better better standards, I think we have a pretty good idea what would be a good voting system, but we also have to solve the sort of the money problem. So as the Help America Vote Act was a big pile of money with very few standards. Um, and that led to a bunch of people spending a whole bunch of money. But if you replace it, now they're sad because they, they have all these machines that are uh, useless. Um, and they need to buy it for the new, new machines. So it may require a little bit of investment to upgrade the, the machines. Uh, there have been some uh, bills designed to provide that investment, but not as much has been provided as, as would be, be needed. And certainly, you know, you don't want to spend uh, uh, tax dollars unnecessarily, but relatively speaking to all the various things that the government spends its money on, uh, putting some money into uh, investing in these things would be, uh, I think, worthwhile. Yeah, it's also just worth, you know, this is sort of the schoolhouse rock level of um, uh, election law. Um, the, uh, you know, it's worth pointing out the federal government has an incredibly limited and indirect role here. Um, you know, if you look at the U.S. Constitution, there are like, you know, three sentences in it on voting, and all of them basically say it's up to the states. Um, so, uh, fed, you know, this is not something that can be just accomplished with sweeping federal legislation. Um, there's, um, uh, you know, voting is the time and manner of, uh, time, place, and manner of voting is up to individual states. And in almost every case in the individual, in the various states, almost all of the operations of elections are delegated to counties. There are 3,000 counties in the United States. That means that the voting, the budget 
for voting equipment is in most cases competing with the budget for the fire department and road repair and other things that people like. Um, and so you can imagine being a county official and saying, hey, guess what? We're going to get you the best voting machines ever, and we only have to close three fire stations in order to do it. Um, you know, so uh, one area where the federal government has some leverage is to create funding and saying, you know, you can use this funding to buy voting machines, but they have to meet these particular requirements. You were very anxious to say something. Uh, so locally, um, that's the way we've been able to uh, get uh, attention to this is go to the Capitol okay, when the uh, General Assembly session starts in January. And Common Cause of Georgia, Voter GA are your most active groups. And we build those we build those subcommittee meetings every single time. And they heard us. And that's that is the way, and then really working on the legislatures. We need uh, people working on the legislatures that are not in the metro area. They're all over the state because, and they, uh, we were able to actually get a bad bill stopped, and that was, uh, and but now we're trying to get the the types of things that he's talking about, like risk limiting audits, you know, um, paper ballots. The, the, uh, and you have to be careful because the vendors are saying we're using paper ballots, but there's a big difference between a paper ballot and a hand marked paper ballot and that's what we have to demand for is a hand marked paper ballot otherwise we still have the unverifiable problem so. all right very good um, and just you know as, as a general matter if you're trying to be uh, an activist uh, on, on this or other topics the amount of effort that you put in has a direct relationship to the amount of effect it is so that if you sign a petition that's probably not very much effective if you send an email that's a little something maybe uh, but like if you start making phone calls or in-person meetings like that makes a difference uh, So the, the more effort that you're willing to put into an issue is seen by your representatives as a signal of how strong the support is And if one person comes in in person, they figure there's a whole bunch of other people who also care about the issue who didn't show up uh, Two questions if I might uh, the first one is short and technical and the second one is may maybe uh, a longer answer and uh, dicier the first one is when the voting machines first showed up in the early 2000s one of the benefits that was touted was um, uh, assistance to visually impaired people mm -hmm. uh, I haven't heard anything about that since uh, like 2002 but um, I was wondering if you uh, have any insight as to how that might be addressed with any new system? Yeah. So Just this like is this is yeah. So let me let me just address that briefly. Okay. This is a really difficult um, uh, issue because the touchscreen voting machines do have some benefits, right? The um, voting experience in general for everybody, um, you know, people generally kind of like using them. It's a familiar interface, um, you, know, uh, you know, other than the security issues. Um, in particular, they can be adaptive and assistive, not just for um, visually uh, impaired, uh, you know, with audio interfaces and braille buttons and so on, but uh, mobility impaired um, uh, users. There are all sorts of interfaces for these machines that can make it possible for somebody who would otherwise need someone else to vote on their behalf uh, to, to get significantly more independent. So, you know, it, it it's easy to, you know, to, to just paint this with too broad a brush and uh, um, and and say well let's 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 just not worry about those people um, but fortunately this is one of the you know advantages of the optical scan systems there is a technology called ballot marking uh, machines where you basically get the same interface that you would have with a touch screen um, um, voting machine with a DRE voting machine but instead of recording the vote internally it outputs a marked paper optical scan ballot that can then just be fed into the normal uh, voting system. What? Oh, okay. Um, wow. Uh, the uh, thin, thin walls here. Yeah, because I think it, it sounded like you said, "Well, where can I get one?" Um, the uh, and uh, 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 great question. Uh, you know, uh, so. I mean, and you know, so these exist today. You can um, uh, states can get them. Uh, most places that have optical scan, um, uh, exclusively optical scan system, do have one of those available at each polling place. Although it's kind of uh, unevenly distributed. So I just got a, a note here to share with you that 
Uh, that Georgia, it's the AccuVote TS, which is the system, which is a, a DRE uh, uh, system. Um, and I don't know if we specifically have you have you worked oh, yeah. on that one? Yeah. And yeah. How is it? It, it? It's just as good as you'd expect. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the second question. Oh, I'm sorry. The second question I was going to ask, if, if you don't mind. Um, it just feels like the the politics of this is more than just lobbying by the, the by these companies, the the, the VM companies. Um, do, your gut feeling: Do you feel like politicians don't want to change? You know, I, I have to say I've been working this. Speaking just for myself, I've been working sure. in this area for for 20 years. Um, I have been spending most of those 20 years being very pessimistic about the ability for progress to be made. I am optimistic for the first time um, over, over the last few years. I've been optimistic really for the first time. There is actual bipartisan interest in addressing this. I think both parties right now at this particular moment in time recognize that the legitimacy of elections is a little bit in peril and does not serve anybody very well to have people question it. And so, you know, I have been, I've been on the Hill testifying on, on the technology issues a couple times. I have, uh, you know, in, in the last few years, I've been invited by both the majority and the minority parties. Um, and that, you know, just didn't used to happen. Yeah, those, sometimes it can be more, um, Suspicious, perhaps, uh, in, in certain places around uh, uh, the world, where uh, they have a long-lasting ruling party that have do, done things like put uh, security researchers in jail for uh, finding election security flaws. Um, so I think there, there still is a lot of work to be done uh, to to get basically uh, better election systems uh, worldwide uh, and better better rules for security researchers. Well, I think it was interesting in the last election, when which was decided by 78,000 votes, that there is no commitment. Even if you had the means to do an audit, the commitment for audits is very weak. Uh, not only various states going, eh, too much money, and who had standing to sue for recounts and things like that. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is, if you're concerned about voter accuracy, both political parties send observers to certain precincts. I'm sorry, I'm a Virginian. We get to do that. I'm not sure if we can do it here. And you basically watch the election workers. Mm -hmm. And um, you also get to vote early if you do that. So look into it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just put in a quick plug. The punchline for this whole thing is if you're concerned about any of this stuff, the best way to get started, become a poll worker. Almost every state in the United States, um, there's a huge um, uh, temporary labor uh, force that operates uh, uh, the uh, elections on at the local precincts. They need people to come do it. If you do that, you will learn a lot of detail about how election operations actually uh, happen. You will meet your local officials. Um, those contacts are invaluable. So you know best thing you can do is sign up to become a poll worker. We had a bunch of people on this side. Except in Oregon because it's all by mail there. Um, quick right. question. So will early voting take care of possible issues in November? Should we all go and vote early? That's my kind of first quick question. And voting by mail is a usually done in form of a hand-marked paper ballot that is then machine counted. So even if you have DRE uh, electronic only devices at the polling place, if you're if you're voting by mail, you get to you know choose a different system for that. Uh, but I mean that is uh, a fine thing for for you know for doing it uh, to avoid the polling lines, do a bunch of things. But we're trying to also make sure that the whole system works, so that yeah. uh, unless uh, uh, this this option, I mean, I guess it's in Oregon, they, they do this uh, uh, statewide. Uh, but uh, uh, to really get at the root of this problem, it needs to affect uh, the the whole system from top to bottom. Um, I, I, you said we would touch on this, so I want to make sure we do. Did Russia hack the election? 
Was it possible for them to do so? Uh, regardless of what anyone says, I want to hear what you guys have to say. Possibly, yes. So I'm going to, uh, you know, I don't know uh, what, whether the outcome of the election was affected by Russia, but I will, let me answer a slightly different question, which is that traditionally the threat that election systems have been designed to withstand is the traditional threat, which is corrupt person wants to get themselves elected dog catcher, right? And, uh, or, you know, corrupt election official is willing to, you know, sell the office of dog catcher to the highest bidder. Um, and our election systems, to the extent that they've been designed to withstand a threat, that's what the threat looks like. It has not historically been designed to withstand foreign state actor wants to disrupt election. And that's a very, very different threat for two reasons. First, foreign state actors have way more resources, right? The resources of an, an intellig hostile intelligence service um, it, you know, are way, way uh, outgun the resources of any individual county to protect uh, against uh, an attack. But secondly, they might not be interested in picking the winner. They might be, uh, it might be sufficient for a hostile a uh, state actor to simply disrupt the election enough that it calls into question the legitimacy of whoever the winner is. And uh, that is, so they both have more resources and an easier job um, because there are, our systems are simply not designed to withstand that kind of threat. Things like deleting the voter registration databases or making the uh, voter de uh, registration database sufficiently uh, wrong that half the people are being turned away on, on election day. Uh, you know, those are relatively easy things to do compared to actually picking the, uh, the uh, ultimate winner of an election. Yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree that, uh, I mean, one of the things, you know, of course it's terrible that a lot of these things don't have ability to do audits and do checking, so it, it is hard to get the data to find out. But keeping in mind that actually changing the result of election, especially a nationwide run, is a really hard job because you have to do it at all the, the various counties you know, that are, are key. You have to have a good idea which ones are going to be the key counties. Uh, in, in some cases, like have people who are on the ground uh, there if they're not, you know, sort of connected to the internet. So there's there is a uh, a little bit of a structural advantage in our very confused system where counties are, are doing most of the uh, of the work here. Is it makes it a little bit harder to do things at a at a large scale unless you're going after statewide systems like voter registration databases and, and so on. But going after individual machines to, to adjust the count, we've certainly shown that that can be done on some of these machines, but to do that on a nationwide scale is a fairly hard job. Um, so this is kind of a follow-on to her question about early voting and voting by mail because we were in the Georgia 6th for that whole fun thing. And um, we received from the Secretary of State a, if you would like to request a mail-in ballot, this is the thing you fill out, put it in this envelope, send it to us. We never got the mail-in ballot, and w it was, d it finally made its way back to us after eight months and <coughs> said, undeliverable as addressed. And it was the freaking envelope the Secretary of State had <laughs> sent us. And that, to me, seems to be, and we were, we're in a very blue part of, we're in the blue corner of Georgia 6. So that, to me, seems to be like the the bigger issue of the voter rolls, pur purging the voter rolls, um, because that seems to be like the thing that's more easily targeted. And what what can people do aside from just checking their registration? Is there anything that individuals can do to sort of make sure they're not falling victim to to those things? Yeah. So you know, I, I, it it's helpful to kind of separate these things into two categories, right? There's the the technical aspect of this, right? What do you, you know, how are these systems vulnerable to, um, you know, ex external tampering or, or um, so on, both the voter registration and the back end systems as well as the actual voting systems themselves? And, you know, for that, I come back to, you know, get as close, encourage people to go as close to precinct counted optical scan ballots with risk limiting audits uh, as they can get, because that's the state of the art um, for uh, secure voting technology. But there's a second dimension of this, which is the political dimension, right? Uh, there are, you know, there are all sorts of ways of influencing an election that have nothing to do with technical attacks and everything to do with, you know, using the political process in ways that provide an advantage. 
And that, you know, I'm going to kind of declare a little bit beyond our scope, except to say you have to love the system, right? You have to be engaged. You have to have, um, uh, you know, you have to pay attention to it. You have to hold voting officials, you know, your local officials accountable. You have to uh, do all of the tedious, boring things that democracy demands us to do and be infuriated all the time. Um, <laughs> I think we have a number of people who have been waiting for, for questions. Earlier, someone said something about they thought a manual um, thing was the best. I was just going to say I, I disagree with that. I think the best is what we have in North Carolina, which is you push the screen, and then in a, win in a window that you can't touch, it's printed in, you know, you voted for Joe Candidate um, so that you can see that it's correct, and then you have something tangible that you can check that I think it would be really hard to tamper with. And then you also have the electronic. But my question is this, <coughs> which is, I just wanted to make that statement. My question is this, um, what about early voting? That seems like um, a statistically relevant sample size that you could uh, pretty much guess the outcome of the election. So if, if you really wanted to hack it bad, you would get that early sample and say, well, Joe Kennedy is leading by 7%. I just need to tweak the machine by 7%, 8% or 9% or whatever so that you make it look not too bad of a landslide so no one, you know, raises any questions. What about, you know, the security of early voting? Yeah, so one of the things, the properties that you need an early voting system to have is that those results have to be kept confidential until the actual count and they have to not actually be released because you can do exactly that, that sort of thing. So, yeah. you know, you have to love it. You have to pay attention to it. You have to do all of that, that stuff right. Hello. Um, uh, first, something kind of funny. On the uh, sixth district in Georgia election, after the election, I got a notice stating that my poll location had moved, with the um, the notice having a date of the day before the election. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, on the on the marked ballot thing, I'm I'm very much in favor of the, the marked ballot kind of system. One machine to mark the ballot, in human and machine readable. Another to to scan so you can verify, and then put it in a scanning one ballot box, full verifiability every step. I also like the notion of not depending on computers to do things right because a person can verify things at each step. So my question is that I, I always see people try to improve the system by saying we'll have open source code or more provably complete code. And there tends to be a lack of understanding that you can't know for sure that that's really what the computer is running. And uh, people just get kind of off, off, off the subject with that. Yeah. How do you address that? Because I see that time and time again. Um, so, I mean, there, there's a lot of value to having open source code in the sense that uh, uh, one, that, that makes it easier for researchers to check the, the code, but you're absolutely right, right? I mean, it, it, that, that is the purported code and you need to also have that uh, be the, the actual code being, being used. Uh, but still, like, if you're talking about open source versus closed source, uh, it is easier to check the system if it is, is open source and you know you can hopefully find the accidental flaws that are doubtless in there uh, if people are, are looking at it. Yeah, I mean the problem is not that this voting machine software is closed source software. The problem is it's software, right? Um, yeah. And open source, you know, I love open source software, but it's not magic. Um, it's still software. And there's always the Brian Kernahan experiment where he hacked the C compiler so that it would insert his own code whenever it was compiled. It would recognize itself and then insert some code in there. Yep. Yeah. I work in the medical field and we use computers but we still have paper. And even though there's a tremendous push toward using more and more and more computers, <coughs> I see this in voting also. Because I was on the board of registrars we had to keep the voter ball. And we had paper and optical readers. It seems like there's going to be a limit that maybe we shouldn't use total software, even in voting. And I don't, it sounds like that's the big divide right there, whether we should take total electronic or software or have a combination. And I don't see that total software is ever going to be totally secure. Yeah, yep. I mean, this is why the kind of risk limiting audit aspect of it is, is central. You know, use computers, but make sure you design a system around that that. Uh, ensures that you're not actually depending on the on the software or hardware. 
Um, and that, you know, that's kind of the best we got. Uh, one, one thing that people kind of, uh, a common thing people say is, uh, you know, in my country, we just use hand-counted paper ballots. Why don't you stupid Americans do that? And you know, one re you know, one problem is, well, you know, we're stubborn, we're Americans. But there's, uh, you know, a thing that people don't realize: we vote in the most complex elections in the world, right? Uh, American elections are by far. Uh, um, we vote on more ballot issues. There are more different races. There are more more contests. We have, um, uh, you know, a referenda in many cases, bond issues. We vote for all sorts of different offices. In most of the country, most parliamentary um, systems, you're voting for one or at most two different uh, ballot issues. Uh, doing this by hand is incredibly difficult in in the United States, where it might be practical. Um, in, in other uh, locations. The other uh, issue that makes this particularly difficult is in the United States, it is for all practical purposes impossible to do over an election. Um, if you, it is not sufficient to detect that an election has been tampered with. You have to actually recover the true result because it, we, you know, we, it, we almost never invalidate an election and, and, and do it over, and particularly for a national, uh, a, a national office election. It's effectively impossible to, to, to do. So this puts extra, extra pressure on the system, not just to detect problems, but to recover from them. So that feeds perfectly into my question. So you mentioned your sense of optimism. Does that extend to confidence in the legitimacy of our upcoming national election? We're talking about the 2018 election? Yeah. I'm, you know, an optimistic person by nature. Um, <laughs> but uh, look, it, we're not going to be able to change any of the technology between now and November. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it is too late to do that, um, uh, it, you know, almost, almost anywhere. Um, but, you know, one, one, hopeful sign is people are paying attention to this issue and you know sunlight is a great disinfectant um, here so so I've got a question for you even though I'm volunteering here uh, who in the world does this the best who would be the model for for us even though our elections are more complex and could we ever get that technology or is that IP so locked down now that we couldn't get it uh, and then who in the United States does it the least bad <laughs> yeah, so there are a number of states that are just using what is regarded as the, the state of the art, which is um, uh, optical scan, precinct counted ballots, um, and risk limiting audits. Colorado has mandatory risk limiting audits. Virginia is almost there. Um, you know, so there are a couple of uh, states that are kind of already at the sort of model ideal um, um, uh, for this. Um, and you know we don't. You know this is not a matter that there's some great technology out there that's really complicated that we just don't have access to. We kind of know how to do this. Um, yeah, just a matter of getting getting those uh, the various counties who don't have those machines to have the resources in order to replace the machines they have. Uh, it may also be a matter of having the states uh, to make standards for their counties so that uh, it, is, it is uniform throughout the state. There are some places where you might have a, a state-of-the-art voting system in one county but not in another. Um, you know, like the path is, is available and we just have to decide like as a society that it is that this voting is fundamental to our democracy and we need to put the, the resources into making it as strong and uh, resistant as we possibly can. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm hopeful that we will get there, um, and it may, may take a little while longer, but we've, we've come some distance from the, uh, uh, some of the, the worst of the worst that was coming out out of uh, the early 2000s. Um, speaking of that, uh, other countries have made uh, voting day a national holiday. What, we, what do you think of doing that here? It'd be great if we did yeah. that, you know. It'd be great if we didn't have to vote on Tuesday. Um, but I. Oh, we could all vote by mail. We could vote by mail. Oregon. Oregon's vote by mail for every election now. Yeah. So one of, one of the interesting things about vote by mail is, uh, you know, it has a lot of the advantages. It gets a long way there. Precinct 
counted systems have the have a benefit that vote by mail doesn't have, which is that if you make a mistake on your ballot and overvote, um, you know, try to vote for two people for president or whatever, which a mistake some fraction of people make, it can be rejected um, when you try to cast it, and you can be given a new paper ballot if, if that's not what you meant to do. Sure. Vote by mail, you're kind of dropping it in the mail, and, and whatever you filled out, that's, that's your ballot. Um, so you said that technology cannot be changed between now and November, but is the system being watched, and by whom right now for November? It is up to you. We've all got to pay attention. That's the best we got. <coughs> Hi, um, <coughs> I work in IT and software in the banking industry, and I was just wondering, isn't there a way for a voter to have verifiability remotely, and has that been considered as a part of an interface that would include both paper ballots and electronic voting, but able to have someone give an encryption key and able to check how they voted, if it was correct or not? So speaking as a cryptographer who's kind of worked in this area, here's the problem. Voting is like the hardest, by far, voting in civil elections is the hardest technical problem I have ever worked on. And one of the problems is that it is heavily, heavily constrained. Because you want the, you want the ability to audit, you want the ability to ensure that every vote was counted. At the same time, you need the property called receipt freedom. That is, nobody should be able to prove how they voted. Um, and not only is it, should it not be possible to find out how someone else voted, you can't even prove how you voted so that that way you can't be coerced into voting in a particular way. Um, those two requirements from a technical point of view are fundamentally in conflict with each other in almost any system that you try to, to, to design. This one is really hard. The problem is any of these systems where the voter can later verify their own vote, means they know some secret that they can be coerced into revealing. So it, it, it just doesn't, it's not compatible with our secret ballot requirement. Say that um, someone has been elected and then halfway through their term, they find the voting is found to be false. <clears throat> what typically happens in that situation? They continue their term. Usually the, in almost every, for almost every office there's a process at which the election is certified prior to them taking office. Once the certification happens in almost every state, that's it. Um, I think you answered it, but I was wondering if online voting with blockchain is possible in the future. Yeah, yeah th thanks very much for not talking about blockchain earlier. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, 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 um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, again, it just fundamentally has the same, same problem that if, if you know the secret for verifying it, you can be coerced into revealing it. If the answer is blockchain, you ask the wrong question. <laughs> We've got a time for maybe one or two more questions, then we have to wrap this up. So if we went to an all-mail system, then what's keeping, you know, somebody from intercepting mail trucks and getting a hold of the ballots and, you know, going that route. I, yeah. yeah, detectability, I guess, is the main thing, is that, that uh, if a mail truck is intercepted, then at least the person driving the truck has, has noticed this. Uh, <laughs> we would hope so. You know, I mean, yeah, the, 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 you know, absolutely, there can, there can be issues. It's just trying to, you know, you're trying to make things a harder job. That, that, that's a lot of uh, uh, security is understanding what threats you make and try and make those those threats harder, more expensive, more difficult to to accomplish. And so, if we went with with vote by mail, they said, "Well, yeah, someone can intercept the mail, or or you can, uh, uh, you know, duplicate the the vote by mail packet and then send in one for somebody else to create a weird double vote." There's lots of attacks that you could do, but they're hard. And one of the things that we are worried about with electronic voting systems is that some things that would be harder to do on physical uh, paper, like ballot stuffing or creating duplicates and such, they're a little bit easier to do when you just have to do it on a, with, with electrons. Right. 
So my question is similar. Why the advocacy that I'm hearing for vote by mail or online voting when there is basically no integrity that you know that the person voting is the person who's supposed to be voting, that they're doing it in secret and that they're not being coerced? Yeah, that, that's a disadvantage of vote by mail. So, you know, uh, um, you know in particular, you know, it, this is not necessarily the, you know, somebody pointing a gun to someone's head. You know, it's the husband checking the wife's ballot to make sure she voted right, you know, and, and that, that happens. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, you know, precinct counted optical scan ballots where you go to a polling place, maybe with early voting locations, is, is kind of solves a lot of these problems. So we have like one more question. You get the last, last word. One, last one. If you're concerned that uh, perhaps the Secretary of State's office or other elected officials who are in charge of voting uh, or any aspect of the election might be doing something uh, illegal, such as wiping a crucial data server from the 2016 election, for example, uh, when it was sought in a lawsuit, uh, what are some legal remedies that, that could be pursued? And so well, I, we have a lawyer as, on this yeah, panel. As the, as the lawyer on the panel, I guess I can forget. I, if, if somebody is, is disobeying or violating the, the law, uh, then they're sort of the, the, you sue to get the court to say, stop doing that, right? An injunction to, to order them to obey the, the, the law or stop doing the thing that was violating the, the law. Uh, some of the, the challenges with that are you know, who has uh, standing to do things. Uh, standing is a concept in the law that is basically only some people who have a concrete and particularized interest in it can bring lawsuits. So there's some hurdles that would need to be uh, overcome. They have to think about a particular uh, circumstances. But uh, uh, a, an official who has been charged on the law to take care of certain things should be taking care of it. And if you can show that they have not, uh, then you can get a, a court to say uh, you need to do this. Yeah. So again, it's you know, you have to pay attention. We have to love, we have to love our democracy in order to keep it. And uh, yes, yep. yep, volunteer, become a poll worker. Um, that's the best thing you can do. You you have time in most places to still sign up for the November election, and I strongly urge you to yeah. consider doing that. And thank you all for coming out Monday. Dragon yeah. Con, almost over, almost over. Thank you, everybody.